Wow. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're sure glad to see you. Uh, you know how we, I like to play this game when there's somebody new in the crowd, you guys have to figure out before you leave today who they are, where they're from, and as much information as you can. So there is somebody new among us today. So the mission is on. Well, we're thrilled to be here again, and um, I, don't, I don't think there's any new major announcements that need to be made. No, next, uh, next Sunday into Monday is uh, One Day, One Movement on November 1st. Uh, Church of God globally is going to observe a day of prayer, fasting for those who want to participate, so... Nice, nice. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, we're not going to collect an offering at any point in time in the service. The uh, offering plates are at the back on the credenza. So if you want before you come in or as you come in or as you leave, you're more than welcome to uh, plant some seeds. Um, I just really feel like you know, we're excited about our speaker this morning. I know he's got something from the heart of the Father for us. And I just want us all to be encouraged. You know, the enemy wants us to look at everything that's going on and wants us to believe that uh, he's winning. Well, I got news for everybody. I read the end of the book, and here's a spoiler alert. <laughs> we win. So it doesn't matter what you're feeling uh, we win. I just want to remind you of a verse I shared last week about Ephesians 2.10. We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined with, to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works that we would do to fulfill it. Amen. Amen. Father God, we just thank you for an opportunity to get together in your presence in, in, as a group. And uh, Father, we know that you love us. We know that you care for us. We know that you've made every provision for us. That you've given us all power and authority, and we just pray that people can uh, walk in that, that they can draw strength from that, that your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Father, there's no fear, there's no sickness, there's no sadness in heaven. So we pray that your kingdom will invade each and every person here today. We thank you for... Uh, worship that we're, we're going to worship you in song. And so we thank you, Father God, that that may be a time of us refocusing on who you are and your great and incredible wonders. Father, we thank you in advance right now for uh, the guest speaker today. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Father God, that he will be able to accurately capture your heartbeat and convey it to us. So, Father, I just pray that each and every person today will calm their hearts. Dear Jesus, I hope that's you calling. <laughs> Father, we just thank you that uh, there's nothing impossible for you. So we just thank you, Father, right now for your love, mercy, and grace uh, on every person here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And that'd be a good time to say, if you've got an electronic device on, please make sure it's off. <laughs> Let's stand together. Save the rich, let me be. 
Jesus is yours and that you belong to him. Amen. He is a good father. Thank you, Jesus. In this time
Lord God, you are not a man that you can lie. Father, how we love your word, how we love your love letter to us, how we love your Holy Spirit who takes that word and makes it come alive in our hearts and our lives.
last a song that we're going to sing together is entitled Waymaker. And how many of you know that God is one who makes a way where there seems to be no way? Amen. Amen. Uh, Isle's going to uh, lead us in on this song. And um, we want, as we sing this song, this song was written by a, a Nigerian worship um, leader named Sinachi, and for those of you who've been following in the news, you know that um, Nigeria has seen some incredible uh, civil, un not unrest in the civil, but just crackdown in the military. Um, Ayo's un uncle was shot. Um, thank goodness it was in his leg, and he is on the mend, but um, there has been a lot of um, confusion and fear amongst uh, the, our Nigerian brothers and, and sisters and the folks that live there. So let's, as we sing this song, let's declare that God is not only God over our circumstances, He is God over the circumstances, amen, that this song, the, the country that this song came from. Let's just declare God is Lord over Nigeria.
I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. for your faithfulness, Lord God. Father, for those who are not able to be with us this morning, we just thank you that you are God who is everywhere at all times present. And we pray, Father, that wherever people are watching this, whenever they're watching, Lord God, that you would just invade that place, Lord, that space with a mighty manifestation of your presence, of your tenderness, Lord God, of your care. Father, as uh, we prepare our hearts for the word, we just thank you for our brother hands. 
Lord, we thank you that uh, there's nothing in your word that he's not passionate about. So, Father, give us ears to hear what you desire to impart to us through our brother this morning. And the spirit and the bride said, yes, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Give someone a nod, a wink. Uh, just tell them you love them as you're seated. And come on up, brother. Hands. Well, good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? Good. Well, uh, here's a good prayer. You may want to write this down. I learned this some time ago. And, and it's this. It says, Lord, make me the person my dog thinks I am. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have a dog, you'll understand. You'll understand what that's about. <laughs> All right. Uh, well... Let's pray and uh, get started. Thank you, Father, that you're here by your Holy Spirit, and we thank you that you're in our midst. And I pray you would uh, speak to us this morning, Lord. We, we always need to hear from you, and we want to hear from you this morning also. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, this is a... This is a message that uh, kind of things develop slowly sometimes. You ever notice when God tells, shows you something and then it gets, it, he builds on that over time. And uh, this is one of those uh, messages. And it, it goes from just being the Logos uh, to at some point it becomes Rhema. And that's where it really starts to take off, doesn't it? Because it's like a nuclear bomb. It can do all sorts of things. And, and you want to be careful when you're dealing with, with a bomb. Okay, so uh, say I have a rich uncle, right? And he's worth millions and millions of dollars, and he dies. And his lawyer writes to me and says, Everyone mentioned in the will as a beneficiary is to meet at my office and he, he gives a certain date and a certain time. I actually did have a rich uncle in Los Angeles. So on the flight, I'm thinking what? What am I going to be thinking? What has he left for me? Right? What's he going to leave for me? He had that nice Corvette. That would be nice. And a few million would be nice too. And uh, while well, God has invited, has uh, given us, he has provided an inheritance for us, just like a rich uncle might, right? But it's even better than anything your rich uncle could, <laughs> could <laughs> deliver. So let's look into Ephesians and see just how this works, because Paul really lays this out here. Um, and uh, it goes like this. Uh, right from the first chapter. He says, uh, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to God's holy people in Castlegar who are faithful followers of Jesus Christ. May God our Father uh, give us grace and peace. He says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Why and how? Because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Uh, so we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son, in the beloved, the King James says. Um, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son. Uh, God has now revealed to us uh, his mysterious plan regarding Christ. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together, 
under the authority of Christ. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance. And uh, do you see a theme developing here? And uh, all right, so the church is his body. It is made complete by Christ who fills everything. All right, so uh, verse, chapter 2, verse 6, for he, God, raised us up from the dead along with Christ. What a thought. When Christ was raised from the dead, we were raised from the dead. So he raised us up from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him, with Christ, uh, in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Uh, all right. And verse 7, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. All right, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he's planned for us. All right. So, uh, verse what verse are we on here? Verse 12. You lived in this world without God and without hope. That was our past. But now you have been united with Christ. Uh, once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. You see what marvelous things are ours, and you notice why they're ours and how they're ours. So we are carefully joined together in him. All right. Uh, and because of Christ and our faith in him, we can come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Why can we come into God's presence? Because of Christ. So uh, it may be easy to not even be aware of this, but Paul really points out why we are, where we are, right? So we can assess where we came from and where we're going and what God has for us and how it can operate, right? Isn't that marvelous? I mean, we might want, we might want to read this by yourself and see uh, the many times in the New Testament, in fact, 134 times in the New Testament, it, it says, in Christ, in him, because of Christ, in union with him, uh, etc. So every time you see that, you can say, that's me. That's for me. That's who I am. That is my position. With, in union with him, I can do all that I'm called to do. If I'm not uh, united with him or spending time with him, Whatever it is I'm called to do probably isn't going to get done, right? So you see our dependency on Christ and who he is and on his blood and what it's done for us. Okay, so uh, how do we walk this out? Because the thing with the word of God, it needs to be applied, right? It's just like if you're taking tr training as a p pilot, Sooner or later, somewhere along the line, in all that technical training, you're going to have to get into an airplane and fly the thing. Otherwise, you're wasting your money on that course. <laughs> and it's the same with us as believers. This is our instructor's manual. And uh, we need to take off. All right, so... Uh, some examples, is there any, oh good, somebody brought, somebody brought water, wonderful. That must be Kathy. Thank you, thank you. Some examples of where, where this, where people were actually putting this into action, right? Marilyn Hickey, you, you probably know her, she's quite well known, a pastor from Denver. And this, this is this year, this was uh, 2020. She went to Tibet with a plane load of believers, and Tibet, of course, is a part of China. 
and they're very strict about Westerners coming to witness there. And they told her, if you say anything about Jesus, you and your bunch here are going to be on the next plane out, right? So she said to her group, well, we're in union with Christ. So as we prayer walk silently, let's keep that in mind. And the government sent along an agent to keep track of these people, to keep them in line. And one of the first things the government agent said to them is, do you know anything about Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she, she said, well, I brought four Bibles uh, in my luggage. And he says, well, I want one of those. And then he, he took them to the monastery in Laza. You might have seen pictures of it. A huge, huge uh, monastery. The patella or whatever it's called. And uh, the abbot of the monastery, now these are very strict Buddhists, and he says, do you have any Bibles? <laughs> this is what's going on in the world today. Jesus. And this was just a few months ago. And she says, well, I have three Bibles left. And he said, well, I want them. And he started Bible studies with his monks. And today, over 200,000 monks in Asia are born again. Buddhist monks. And in Acts 3, verse 1 to 6, uh, Peter and John are going to the temple, and they're also aware that they're in him, in Christ. And uh, so there's a guy there, and he, he's, a beg he's a beggar. He's begging for money. He's paralyzed. His legs are paralyzed. And uh, they said to him, well, we don't have silver and gold. In other words, we don't have any cash on us. But what we have, we will give to you. And says, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk, which he did. Now, what did they have? They had power and authority. Right, just like uh, uh, Marilyn Hickey did in, in Tibet. And God just loves to work through us. Jesus loves to work through believers, if we we'll let him, okay? So Peter and John had power and authority, but so do we, right? I mean, usually we think of Peter and John, well, if, if you're a Catholic, Peter is really a big shot because he's the first pope. But uh, we usually think, well, Peter, he was really quite amazing, but I'm not so amazing. That's a big mistake because the, the same amazing Christ that was in Peter is in us, yes. right? <laughs> okay, so how did Peter and John get this power and authority. Well, they got it from Jesus, and we get it the same way, and it's just as available to us as it is to Peter and John, because we tend to think of, of the big revival that happened under the apostles. Well, what God's starting to do now is gonna be bigger than that. Okay, so as we move in union with Christ, his power and authority works in us, and it comes out through us. That's how this thing works, right? The Christian life. So, <clears throat> another story. <clears throat> Marilyn Hickey and her hubby had a small church in Denver 30 or 40 years ago. And <clears throat> Daisy Osborne, the wife of T.L. Osborne, the uh, well-known evangelist, uh, visited. And she told Marilyn, now, they had a small church, right? And they'd had it for some years. He says, I see you speaking to world leaders and being a worldwide evangelistic ministry. And Marilyn thought, well, Daisy rhymes with crazy. She didn't believe this at all. She thought, that's ridiculous. Well, we just heard what happened in, in Tibet this summer. And she thought, like so many believers do, many of us will do this. Well, I have to have more faith. I have to have more dynamism. I have to have more personality. I have to have more education. You ever have these kind of thoughts? 
They come to every Christian, right? I have to be more holy. And if we say that long enough, we'll be in a graveyard somewhere still trying to get more holy. <laughs> and uh, because God is saying, while she's saying all that, God is saying, she's been brought near to me by the blood of my son. And uh, she can do whatever it is that she's been called to do, right? So God doesn't see us the way we often see ourselves. And that's a good thing because we don't have much of a picture of ourselves often. Uh, so God is thinking about her. Well, she's been brought near to me by the blood of Christ and she can bear fruit. Why not, right? So, as it, uh, here's something that, uh, that happened to me. It, was, it came to mind as I was preparing this. <coughs> Excuse me. As a new believer, and boy, I've got something in my throat. I was a new believer, and I was living in Seattle. And I always felt I wasn't doing enough for God. Uh, and had a, a vague sense of condemnation. Anybody else ever have that problem? <laughs> I'm just not doing enough. I should be doing more. I'm so sinful. And, uh, and I felt I just couldn't come into his presence because of that, right? And then one afternoon, I knelt down in the living room, and I said, Father, I come to you boldly today, because I led somebody to Jesus today, right? You know what I'm in for. And, and uh, because what? Works, right? I did a wonderful thing for you, so now you better bless me, right? And the Lord spoke to me very uh, firmly. Or f I couldn't help hearing it. And he says, wait a minute. If you want every soul in Seattle, and Seattle has two million people, if you want every soul in Seattle to me, you still can't come to me because of that. You come to me because of the blood of Jesus that was shed for you. Yes. That was a, a real eye-opener for me because I didn't think that's how it worked, right? And so much of the time, we don't think that's how it works. I can come to God any time because the blood of Christ that cleanses me at all times. And if I goofed up 10 minutes ago, the blood is there to cleanse me right now. Amen. Right? <clears throat> so God created you uh, to be someone special. And a successful believer may not have massive faith necessarily, but they do have to have obedience to the word. That's one requirement, right? So God is looking for people who will obey, who will obey. So you have to sow something to grow something. So sow obedience. That will bring you a wonderful crop. And our old nature is such that it likes to rebel. It does not I want to obey anybody at any time in anything right? And in that way, we clash with God. <clears throat> so, an evangelist held a meeting for uh, young people from five different churches in a big city. They all gathered together in, in a large auditorium, and during the meeting, he said, clear some space up here for anyone who's sick or injured at the, at the front of the church. So, a youth pastor hobbled up with a cast on one of his legs. And uh, the evangelist said, one of you come up here and pray for him. Well, nobody came up. And uh, so he asked again, somebody come up and pray. He, he had to ask a number of times. So finally a 13-year-old girl came up, right? And she prayed for him. And they took off the cast and his leg was perfectly healed. And the, eva the evangelist said to the girl, you can do this anytime, anywhere. And she said, I can. And he said, yes. So, what did she do? 
She, she happened to be the towel girl for the school football team. And the quarterback got hurt. Uh, this is the high school football team. Uh, soon after that. So they, they had him on a stretcher there. And the girl said, may I pray for you? And he said, yes. And he got up and played the rest of the game. And other players hurt during the season, same thing, may I pray for you? And she did this every game. And soon the opposing teams would say, can we bo borrow your towel girl? <laughs> And 80% of her school got saved. Because somebody was inspired that they can do anything, anytime for God. Yeah. Right. And she's in college now, still turning the place upside down. So, when, you, when you're united with Jesus, expect the miraculous. She's now in college, still doing the miraculous, and God wants to anoint you to do things. Just ask him for it. So God is saying, these are the days when you will know me as the God who comes down to his people to meet with his people. And these are those days where that is exactly what God is doing. So God is a God who came down to meet his own people, you and me, when he united us with Christ. Ephesians 1.11 says, God chose us to be his own people in union with Christ. So nothing works in the Christian life if it's not in union with Christ. I can, I can have three degrees in theology, which I don't, but if I did, so, sometimes those can be a real hindrance, actually. <laughs> but uh, even if I did, if, if I'm not working in union with Christ, I'm going to be a failure as a Christian, guaranteed. Yeah. Guaranteed. So it's in union with Christ that we meet God, and only in union with Christ. So, he does it through Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them. This is the wonderful message he's given us to tell others. That God has given us the task of reconciling the world to himself, through Jesus and the salvation he offers. So if we're in Christ, and we are, we should ask ourselves, how does Christ think about this or that situation? Because often we try to figure something out, a situation, a problem out, a dilemma, instead of just going saying, well, Lord, what do you think? Don't you think that might be more profitable than picking your own little pea brain or me picking mine? So here's a... 104-year-old Afro-American man in Houston. This is quite recent. And he was leaving the church after the service. And the pastor said to him, you must want to get to heaven about now. And the man said, uh, no, I have three sons serving God, but the fourth one isn't serving God. And I'm not leaving till he is... Now, I like his attitude. Amen. So some Christians, they can't wait to be, get out of here. I have had it with this planet. I want out. Well, what about your unsaved family members? That's your responsibility. That's my responsibility. Children, grandchildren, spouses, friends. Christ is as concerned about them as he is about you. And... Uh, uh, so, when Jesus said, near the end of his earthly life, he says, now I'm going away to the one who sent me. Uh, but before it's your time to go, and God will tell you when it's your time to go. Um, God will tell you if you ask him, but don't leave any unfinished work 
on the table. Yeah. Be sure everything is done before you want to check out. Yeah. Right? Ask him, is there anything else I need to do? In fact, we can do that every day. What is there around me right now in my life that I could or should be doing in my neighborhood, in my church, in my community, among my relatives? Philippians 4.13 says, I can do everything through Christ. There it is again, through Christ, who gives me the strength. In union with him, I can do everything God wants me to do. In union with him, you can do everything God wants you to, be, to do. Without him, you're in big trouble. You can't do anything properly without Christ. We, we, we just can't, right? So Ephesians 2.6 says, For God raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. We are seated in the heavenly realms now. Somebody pointed this out a few weeks ago. I'd never heard the word before. We are bilocated. That means we're in two different places, like bi, like in bicycle, which has two wheels, and we're in two places. We are on this planet. You're sitting in the Canary Church of God, uh, but you're also seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. And why are we seated with him in the heavenly realms? Because we are united with Christ. Uh, Ephesians 2.6, you can look it up. So don't, don't you think you and I can intercede for our children and grandchildren and spouse from the position of power and authority that we have in him? And that's exactly what he wants us to do. And people will say, well, I'm, I'm just nothing, and I'm nobody, and that's very factual. But you're in Christ, and that makes you a somebody, Amen. right? As long as you're thinking me and my ability and my intellect and my zeal and my strength, you're in big trouble because that doesn't take you very far. But if, if you say, I'm in Christ, I'm in him, I'm washed in his blood, he speaks to me every day. And from that position, we can take this whole planet. Amen. All right. I told you this story before, but it so impressed me when I heard it. And this happened very recently. A woman in Scotland who's a prophet she went to the shopping, uh, to the department store, and the security guard came up to her, and he said, may I walk with you a while? Because when you walk by me, the voices in my head stopped. So I want to be like her, and better still, like Jesus. There are hurting people at Safeway, the a &W, at the bank, and we can be the hand of God extended to them, extended to the hurting in Castlegar, right? And I don't have to worry about having the ability or the power in myself because I'm in Christ, and he's not short of any power or authority. Or wisdom, for that matter, the wisdom we may need to do. Actually, we need wisdom every day because in ourselves, we're kind of stunned and stupid, <laughs> certainly compared to God, <laughs> right? And yet we go out there and I'll take on the world. I'm smart, I'm intelligent, I, I have whatever ability. No, why don't I just ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? You know, give me your wisdom today because I don't know about you, but I need... His wisdom, because even with his wisdom I goof up, but without it, I'd be worse. <laughs> okay, so, so that Scottish lady, she knew who she was in Christ. And she had such power and authority that the demons stopped operating when she walked by people. 
And we can have, we have that same power and authority. We just have to learn how to walk in it, right? So operating in Christ, if you want a nice equation, operating in Christ, Christ equals power and authority, right? So it is said of Charles Finney that when he was in a city, the evil spirits wouldn't operate for 50 miles around. Uh, because of the power and authority that was manifesting. So why could this happen? Because he was operating in Christ, and so can you and I, right? So we shouldn't think of these people like that lady in Scotland or like, like Charles Finney and say, wow, that was something. Because we have the same Christ in us, and we're washed in the same blood that they were washed in. So this Scottish uh, prophet had a do- has a daughter, Jessica, who's 17. And her daughter said to her, Mom, I want to go traveling with you. And I want to be on the platform with you ministering because her mother is, uh, travels all over the world. And her mother said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You have to prove yourself first. You can't just come, come out there and start start being on the platform with me, prove yourself. So she went out in Glasgow where they lived with a friend of hers and they ran into a young goth woman. And she wore all kinds of satanic symbols (coughs) and uh, Jessica said to her, I talk to Jesus, is there anything you want to ask him? Isn't that a good (laughs) approach? But we shouldn't laugh too loud because we can do the same thing, right? And this lady said to her, this goth, young goth woman, I worship Satan. I don't care about Jesus. Now that could put some water on your fire, right? (laughs) But Jessica said, you have cancer. And the woman said, how did you know? I just found out from the doctor this morning. And Jessica said, put your head, put your hand on that lump on your breast. And I'm going to pray. She prayed and poof, it was gone. (laughs) And that worshiper of Satan is today a worshiper of Jesus. And this happened within the last year. This is not, you know, in the year 35 or the year 40 A.D. when the apostles were around. (laughs) So she's a believer today. Another group that knew their position in Christ, this group in the 1930s, they decided to only do what God told them to do. Remember, Jesus said, I do only what I see the Father do, and I say only what I hear the Father say. That can make for an easy life in a way, isn't it? Well, I don't have to try to think up all kinds of great things because I, I don't know all kinds of great things in my head, right? But if, if I'm saying only what I see the Father say and doing only what I see him do, it takes the pressure off, doesn't it? It really takes the pressure off you and me to, for, to perform. So that's good advice, isn't it? To, to say only what the Father says, to do only what the Father does. That's how Jesus operated. It worked for him. So these people, they wouldn't even cross the street unless the Father told them to. And you might say, well, isn't that overdoing it a bit? Well, maybe there's somebody on the other side of the street that needs to hear what you have to say. Uh, and they were called the shining ones because they literally shone with the glory of God. And they followed the example of Jesus who said, I do only what I see the Father do. No wonder it worked. The shining ones, they called them. So we are complete in him and we can shine too. So what have we talked about. So Ephesians shows us in the first three chapters how anyone who is in Christ sits and rules with him in the kingdom of God. 
And even better, we are in his presence at all times. Did you know that? We are in the presence of God all the time. If we're aware of that, maybe some of those programs we watch, we might not watch them anymore. Uh, and also, there's more. There'll be a day, according to scripture, when you, yes you, will sit on Jesus' throne. Revelations 3.21, Jesus says, to the one who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Now we say, yes, yes, that just means we're given authority. Yes, but it can also be literal. Uh, so, the one who overcome, you have to be an overcomer. Well, you overcame the world, the flesh, and the devil in him, right? And he says, I will invite you to sit with me on my throne, literally. There'll be a day when Jesus will say to you, come and sit on my throne here for a bit, right? That's pretty good, isn't it? That's what it says. This is one thing about Jesus. You can take what he says literally. You don't have to say, well, that's just referring to something else. If you don't believe him, ask him about that. So living up north, I had a dream. I was working at a community uh, way up there, and I was looking at the community from, in the dream from a fairly high place. So Jesus was standing beside me, and he told me what he wanted of me. And Jesus wants to come down to meet with you and me and to guide us, right? It certainly helps when you know what you're supposed to do, doesn't it? If you have a job, your boss doesn't just say, well, thank you for working here, just do anything you want. No, he's going to give you tasks to do. And if you don't do them, you probably won't be working there very long. And uh, it's the same with God. He, he has tasks for us. Uh, so we, every day we can invite him in, right? Because the task God has given you you cannot do by yourself. I cannot do by myself. That's the starting point, right, of the Christian life. So we invite him in. We can say, Jesus, I invite you in today. Come and meet with me. Talk to me. You know, I want to have a conversation with you all day long. And let me know what it is you want me to do today. Okay? One last thought. Are we out of time? We are, I'll quit. Preach, preach. Okay. So, what is the purpose of all God's dealings with us? John the Baptist distilled it into one sentence. He said, I must decrease and he must increase. Sometimes we get this the wrong way around. I must increase and he, well, anyway, I must increase. Well, that doesn't work too well, does it? So, if I'm successful as a Christian, is because of Jesus working in me. And I must decrease. And that's to my benefit. That's not something where some people, if you think of yourself as a cow patty in the pasture of life, that isn't, that isn't scriptural. Right? So the reason you decrease is so he can increase. This bottle here, as, as long as there's water in it, it, it can't, especially if you fill it to the top, it can't hold anything else, right? But if, if the water decreases, then something else can increase. And the reason God wants us to decrease is so he can increase, right? to do us good, not to give us a hard time. Okay, so how does that work out? So there's, in the Old Testament, there's, there's uh, in Numbers 6, talks about people taking a Nazarite vow. And among other things, you couldn't cut your hair or your beard. And a man in Wales in the 1950s was told by God to take that vow. 
so he did. And he was a respected man in his town. Uh, so his hair grew and his beard grew, and he was not allowed to cut it or trim it. And he found this quite humiliating. He should have waited another 10 years, and then he would have been a hippie and it would have been okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it was humiliating for him, and his friends thought he was getting strange, and his family didn't understand. And he was not allowed to tell them that God had ordered this, right? So God was destroying that willful, proud, old nature. And why was he doing that? So he could be filled with the nature of Christ. So when, when we think God's giving us a hard time, he just wants to have more of Christ in us. Okay, so the name of this man was Reese Howells. And what was the outcome of all these dealings? Well, a man got off the train in his, in his town one day, and he said, where is the man that is filled with the Holy Spirit? And they immediately directed him to Reese Howell's house. That was the outcome of all those dealings. He did get to cut his hair and beard eventually. So, uh, Reese Howells was set apart because of Christ, in Christ, in union with Christ, and we're set apart for the same purpose. And we're going to have to go through dealings because if you think the Christian life is just a cakewalk, you sign up for the wrong life <laughs> because that's not the case. And if your life is a cakewalk, everything is beautiful. I remember I met one guy in Vancouver and I used to be very blunt in witnessing, which is not a good idea. And, and I told him I was having all kinds of trouble in my life. I was a new Christian and God was dealing with me. And, he sa and I said, are you a Christian? He says, yes. And uh, I said, so what about you? And he says, oh, I don't have any problems. I don't have any troubles. And I said, well, I have sad news for you. You're not a Christian. <laughs> he was quite offended. <laughs> okay, so the purpose of all God's dealings with us is to make us just like Jesus, yes. right? That's the purpose of his dealing. And it's worth all the pain to get to that point. So, may God bless each of you as you set yourself to reach that goal. Thank you. Come on up, worship team. We're going to close uh, with a, a song that we were going to do last week. And then when I heard what uh, Hans was uh, speaking on this morning, I said, no, uh, we need to do that next, next week. So um, the song is entitled In Christ Alone. How many of you got something encouraging out of that message? Amen? Um, I always love when Hans preaches because he always brings these amazing testimonies that just stir up faith um, on the inside of us, and those are so important. Thank you so much, um, Hans. And um, in the kids' packs, uh, we put in, in their little things, uh, I can do all things because Jesus lives in me. And then underneath it was like, what is one hard thing that Jesus helps you to do? And I think all of us can think about that. What is one hard thing that you're facing this week? Jesus can help you do that. So let's um, just stand as we close with this song. This solid ground 
burn through the fiercest drought and storm.
Father, we just thank you for this time we've had together this morning, Lord God. I just thank you for everyone that's here, Lord God, for those who haven't been able to join us this morning but are joining us online. Father, we thank you that you have the words of life. And the words of life for us this morning, Lord God, is that if we have said yes to you, Jesus, as our Lord, that our life is hidden in you. We are in him, Lord God. And uh, we just thank you, Lord God, that uh, because you are in us, we are equal to whatever is in front of us, Lord God, whatever we're in the middle of, Lord God. You've gone ahead of us and you've prepared a way and you've said, Lord God, that you are the way maker and uh, that nothing is impossible for you and nothing is impossible for us because we are in you. So, Lord God, stir up our our faith, Lord God, as we go away and we meditate, Lord God, on these scriptures and and we think about these testimonies, these wonderful, amazing testimonies of what you are doing through ordinary people just like us, Lord God, around the world. Lord, may we step out in faith because wherever we go, you go in us, Lord God. Father, if there's anybody watching this morning or or here, I believe everyone here this morning is a believer, but God, if there is anyone who is watching, you're watching and you do not know for certain that you have Christ on the inside, you can know in the next 30 seconds. If you ask, he says he will give to you. And all you need to do is to acknowledge that you need him, that you are a sinner, that you have not come up to his measure of perfection. We've all missed that mark. If that's you, just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. Cleanse me from my sin. And come and fill me to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. I want to follow you all the days of my life. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, Jesus has come to make his home on the inside of you. And we want to say welcome to the family. God bless you, everyone. Keep each other in prayer this week. We can do all things through him who strengthens us. And the church said, amen. God bless you. See you next week.